And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon. See, this tells us clearly they worshiped Satan the devil. They didn't know it. The whole of mankind thinking they're religious individuals, but not knowing they're worshiping Satan, are doing it ignorantly. They wouldn't do it if they understood that was the very thing that they were worshiping, the most evil being in the universe. And it was a dragon that gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this says clearly, there is coming a system that is going to be so powerful militarily that nobody on the face of the earth is going to be able to resist it. This means that anybody who is going to be able to not be involved with this system, it will literally require a divine intervention by God Almighty and His Son Jesus Christ that He's placed as the head of the church. Otherwise, nobody is going to be, make war with this system. And if this system is going to be a war-making device, and is the very purpose for it is to crush those that believe in the living Jesus Christ of Nazareth and God our Father, because Satan wants to be worshipped, then you and I are going to be in deep trouble unless our lives are enmeshed with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Verse 5, There was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So here is a system that's going to speak evil of the true God. And of course, those who follow him and are called saints of the true God. So they're going to speak evil of those who have the Spirit of God inside of their minds. And power was given unto him, this beast system, this government that's rising, to continue forty and two months. So three and a half years, the final three and a half years before the great Jesus Christ roars out of the heavens with his angelic host and those that are going to be resurrected at the last trump and receive their glorified bodies will come and destroy the system. But until that time, it says he's going to rule for three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God and blasphemed his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In other words, he is not going to be pleased with anyone that has anything to do with the true God or the angelic host that did not rebel against the true and the living God. Verse 7, notice why this machine, this warlike machine is going to exist for 42 months unscathed and no one is going to be able to stand up against it. Here's what he's going to be doing. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. A saint is a person who has the Spirit of God inside of their mind. If you don't have God's Spirit inside of your mind as a, as a spirit of begettle to sonship, you're playing religion, but you're not a Christian. You think you are, but you're not. You may be nice, sincere, courteous, considerate to other people, but without the Spirit of God impregnating your mind, you are not a child of God. Romans chapter 8 says it so clearly. If anybody does not have the Spirit of Him, Jesus Christ, then we are not His or Christians. But it says here that He's going to make war with the saints, and notice of all things, God Almighty and Jesus Christ says, I'm going to have hands off and this system is going to overcome these saints. Now that does not sound like a rapture to me. It says clearly the saints are going to be overcome. Now there are a few other scriptures that shows that God is going to divinely protect certain individuals. Certain individuals in one scripture that it says they're the very elect. That means there is an elect of God, but then there is someone else that is the very elect. And someone who obeys God with all of their fiber of their being. And they believe the word of God and don't make excuses to get around it. And it says this, He was given power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. 
Now, how in the world is a system going to rise that is going to have power over everybody on earth and that nobody's going to be able to resist it? There's not going to be individuals out there who are going to be able to stockpile rifles and guns and ammunition so much so that they're going to be able to fight their way and to defeat this system that's coming. It says God is going to back off and let this system rule over all kindreds and nations and tongues. In 1919, after World War I was completed, while the Allies had troops still stationed in Germany, they discovered the rules for communist revolution. Now, communism was in, instituted by the Illuminati worshipers of Lucifer. Some within that movement prefer to call him Satan. Albert Pike did, who laid down the final 100-year program for world government that would be achieved by the end of the 20th century. These rules of revolution said they would take over the mass media in the United States of America and program the minds of the people so that it would turn it against patriots, it would turn it against Christians who wanted to be faithful to Jesus Christ, and it would turn the mass public's mind against those individuals who believed in the Constitution of the United States. I'll just give you one example as to what a wonderful job they've done in programming the minds of individuals. After the Timothy McVeigh verdict was handed down of guilty and then the death penalty, I went to pick up my automobile after a front end alignment. And the young man there said, did you hear the good news? And he explained to me because I hadn't heard it yet. And then he said, I just think that the government, if they knock on anybody's door and they don't answer, they ought to just blow their house up. What are they hiding? This is exactly what they've done to the population of America. They don't even know anymore that they have the right to bear arms. They don't know that they have the right to have a, a search warrant before they come into the premises. But if there is no constitution, then naturally those rights are gone. But the very final act that they said that they would have to carry out an operation to solve this problem was to create conditions in the United States of America under some pretext to disarm and confiscate all weapons from the people. How is this going to happen? There could not be a world government. There could not be an all-powerful government unless the citizens of the world were disarmed and could not defend themselves. Notice the Bill Clinton administration in its second term has now interpreted for the public their interpretation of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Anyone who has any doubt about the Clinton's administration's position on the Second Amendment there is now an official Justice Department ruling. Now, it is not law, but it's their official ruling as to how they will be guiding their administration. I will quote the key paragraph. The Second Amendment, whether in regard to handguns or all guns, is a matter of growing scholarly debate. The current state of federal law does not recognize that the Second Amendment protects the right of private citizens to possess firearms of any type. In other words, he's saying, no, we don't recognize any citizens' right to ever bear arms in this country. We can confiscate and pass laws to take your guns away from you. Then he went on to say, Instead, the Second Amendment is deemed to be a collective right belonging to the state and not the individual. If anybody's ever studied international socialism and communism, they know that collectivism is exactly what communism is. This means Bill Clinton is saying the state is the only ones who has a right to bear arms. Private citizens do not. Therefore, we can take your arms away from you. We can pass laws. We can confiscate them. 
If you don't like it, then we will break your door down and take them from you. What was the survey that was made at the 29 Palms Marine Base out in California? One of those questions out of a 45-point survey was if the government said they wanted to confiscate all firearms from citizens, would you fire upon American citizens if they refused? They were preparing the minds of individual soldiers to attack the homes and the physical bodies of American citizens. Do you believe it's going to happen in your lifetime? The Soviet Union established gun control in 1929. Just from the years 1929 to 1953, over 20 million political dis dissidents, unable to defend themselves because all of their guns were confiscated, were rounded up and exterminated. That's only the political dissidents. That's not the others that they herded up in the middle of the night and took them in boxcars to the front, put them in prison camps, slave labor to work. Then Turkey established gun control in 1911. From 1915 to 1917, one and a half million Armenians, unable to defend themselves because all their guns were confiscated, were rounded up and exterminated. Germany established gun control in 1938. From the years 1939 through 1945, approximately 13 million gypsies, Jews, homosexuals of the effeminate gender, not the masculine type of homosexuals, mentally ill people, and other people that they said were mongrelized of mixed races were unable to defend themselves because they confiscated their guns, they were rounded up and put in the gas chambers. China established gun control in 1935. From 1948 till 1952, 20 million political dissidents who were unable to defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Guatemala established gun control in 1964. Now that's the South American hemisphere. From 1964 to 1981, 100,000 Mayan Indians who no longer could defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Uganda in Africa established gun control in 1970. From the year 1971 to 1979, Christians in that country, no longer able to defend themselves, were rounded up and shot down on the spot. If you've ever seen the movie Red Dawn, where the communists came into the western part of the United States, they did exactly the same thing. Cambodia established gun control in 1956. From 1975 through 77, just three little years, over one million of the highest educated class of people in that country who no longer could defend themselves were exterminated. Do you believe that gun control is a good thing? Listen to what some of the forefathers who created the Constitution of the United States had to say. Samuel Adams said the following, I quote, The Constitution shall never be construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. End of quote. So the founding fathers, at least one of them, said, don't ever misconstrue the Second Amendment to mean anything other than you as a private citizen can bear arms to protect yourself in case the government becomes a tyranny. Thomas Jefferson had this to say, quote, No free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. End of quote. George Mason stated, and I quote, to disarm the people is the most effective way to enslave them. End of quote. Then George Washington, the first president of the United States, I quote him, Firearms stand next to importance 
to the Constitution itself. They are the people's t- liberty teeth. End of quote. Could the United States of America, right now at this point in history, be the subject of tyranny if we were to disarm the people of this country? Who is it? Is it the Bill Clinton administration that is literally the number one enemy of those who hold guns in their homes? Maybe so, but maybe not. Could it be that the United Nations organization has quietly been promoting the concept of civilian disarmament since its very inception, but never had opportunity to move that concept to the forefront until the 1990s when a communist president went into the White House of the United States of America. The very opening shots in the most recent of the United Nations attack on firearms was fired in 1994. As of May 24th of 1994, according to the Washington Times, I quote, The Clinton administration has agreed to participate in a discussion of ways for the United Nations to control the manufacture of guns and their sales to civilians. Do you want the United Nations organization to tell you whether you can even manufacture a gun or whether you can buy one? I've proven over the last 17 years with absolute documentation The United Nations organization was founded by international communists. Every single person from the Treasury and State Department of the United States government that went to San Francisco except one was a communist who founded that organization. It is the blueprint for world tyranny. And they and they alone are the ones who are going to control all weapons on the face of the earth when they've come into their power. And right now, They are bringing about resolutions if adopted by nations would supersede the Constitution of the United States. And no one in this country would be able to hold a firearm or bear that in their homes. Notice another article. The Associated Press reporter Charles J. Hanley. He elaborated on the United Nations scheme to take guns from the American people. Quote, so quietly that even the gun lobby hasn't noticed. The United Nations is beginning to set its sights on global gun control. Does that sound like Matthew 13, verse 4? I'll go on with the article. The United Nations Disarmament Commission has adopted a working paper, a basis for future debate that proposes tighter controls of the gun trade in the United States and other member nations. End of quote. Now since Bill Clinton was trying to get elected in 1994, or 1995 and 6, he was definitely not going to propose the United Nations organization himself that they would start manufacturing weapons and distributing them and selling them to private citizens. He would not do that. So what he did was he worked out a program with the Japanese, the Canadians, and the Colombians in South America. And they would lobby the United Nations for gun confiscation plans. As a direct result, the Japanese, who have one of the most anti-individual rights government, and anti-firearm governments in the world brought forth resolution number nine to the United Nations organization. It's Commission on Crime Prevention. An American attorney by the name of Thomas Mason discovered the Japanese plan that he was bringing to the United Nations organization. Here's what he said, quote, The proposal goes on to call for a general disarming or reduction in the number of firearms available worldwide. It prohibits possession of military weapons by private individuals. It sets limits of sales 
of self-loading firearms to civilians. So if you have a six-shooter, you have to load it. It would prohibit the number of people who could purchase those type of weapons. He went on to say that it requires permits to purchase and establishes waiting periods before you get the permit. It calls for computerized registration of all firearms with the United Nations organization and the banning of handguns except for police and shooting associations. End of quote. Mason went on and added in his statement concerning resolution number nine, once a country signs onto this convention, it would become law in that country. The Japanese are pushing for the establishment of a United Nations bureaucracy on firearms regulations. End of quote. Could it be that the all-powerful United Nations organization that once was nothing more than a sounding board for communist propaganda has now changed? And the American people have not been told that it now has teeth? That now when they pass legislation or resolutions or simply papers that they write and when they accept it, all of a sudden it becomes the law of the land? I will prove it before I'm through here today. The Japanese are the ones who are seeking this legislation through a joint communique with Bill Clinton. The Japanese delegation that has presented Resolution 9 declared the following, I quote, In democratic countries, people's lives and safety should be assured by the government. Citizens should not need to possess handguns for self-protection. End of quote. No, it's only in a government where there is absolute totalitarianism where every single person is controlled and they have every gun, even in the ghettos, even from the warlords who have the drug dealers, only when those people are disarmed can they ever carry out a program where a citizen of the United States or any other nation would not need a handgun for self-protection. They went on to show other nations that have adopted gun control legislation and those countries blame the United States of America such as Colombia they confiscated all the guns there except the drug lords so they, the drug lords run the country and yet they blame the United States of America for manufacturing firearms so they are now suing the United States government in the world court and if they win the United States would have to quit manufacturing firearms. So that means, can they disarm America? Can they disarm the rest of the world? I think so. They're even having another more chilling resolution before the General Assembly. It's called Resolution 43-75-1. And it was proposed in 1988. And it says, quote, the state, that's now means the United Nations, should exercise absolute control over the manufacture of arms, the arms trade, and the possession and use of arms. End of quote. What did we read in Matthew, or not Matthew, but Revelation 13? That there would come a system that would rise at the very end of the age. It was called a beast. When you go back and compare Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 4, or 7, chapter 9, and other chapters, you'll see that a beast in Bible prophecy is a government. So here is a government that's, riding, that's rising out of all the nations on the face of the earth. And it's not going to allow any nation eventually, when it gains control, to have any armaments in the private sector. Only in the military. And the police factions that will control the citizenry. This is happening in your lifetime and my lifetime. Is there really an agenda or is all this just made up? Does the United Nations really have the power or not? 
Why would you say that the government of the United States, state governments, are now suing the tobacco industry? What does the tobacco industry have to do with firearms? There must be a precedent set that a manufacturer, if they harm someone through cigarettes and it creates a burden on the state and an expense of the state, then they can cause that manufacturer to either shut its doors or pay. So what is going to happen now that they've already declared the cigarette industry guilty and they're working out programs to reimburse for hospitalization and that type thing and for health care for those that are, have cancer due to cigarette smoking? What do you think they're going to do with gun manufacturers now that they've got this precedent set? They're going to say if anyone shoots someone in the ghetto with a handgun, that manufacturer can be sued for killing someone. They're the ones who are responsible for it. You see, if you're going to confiscate guns, you have to create a problem. Then you have to furnish the solution to the problem. The, they've created the problem by promoting in the eyes of the American people, people being killed with handguns. The private sector killing other individuals. So now they've got to furnish a solution. So the solution is the manufacturers are partially guilty for the murder of someone because they manufactured the product. Do you think this won't happen? Oh, yes, it is. They already have it under advisement in the United Nations organization to make the manufacturer liable. What is this going to do to you and me? Would handguns have anything to do with a Christian? I don't even own one. I don't like them. But I have the right to bear one and to keep it in my home. The Constitution says so. However... There is now a program that I've warned about since 1985 when former President Ronald Reagan came into his second term. The very first thing he did was call for the Genocide Convention Treaty to the United Nations Organization to be passed into law in the United States. What does this have to do with gun control? The Second Amendment. What does it have to do with your life and my life as we know it right now in America? It has everything to do with it. Because your lifestyle, my lifestyle, and the lifestyle of every American is going to change so radically because of what Bill Clinton, President of the United States, is going to be doing. Notice a headline in the Dallas Morning News, Sunday, June 8, 1997, page 10A. The title, Clinton Calls for Crackdown on Hate Crimes. Now, when you hear the word hate crime, unless you understand why every state in the United States, all 50, had to, by law, pass hate crime laws. Unless you understand that, this title is meaningless to you. But the Genocide Convention Treaty was passed in 1985 by the Senate. There was one dissenting a vote. Then they had to take it to the 50 states. All 50 states had to formulate legislation as to what hate crimes were within the framework of the Genocide Convention Treaty to the United Nations. Then they had to say what would constitute a crime and then what the punishment would be within the confines of that treaty. Because it's United Nations, not just formulated in our own Senate and House of Representatives. I want to quote what Mr. Bill Clinton said about hate crime. Quote, It is time for us to mount an all-out assault on hate crimes, to punish them swiftly, severely, and to do more to prevent them from happening in the first place. Notice, prevent them from happening. Just wait till you hear what a hate crime is now going to be. Then how are they going to prevent it in the first place? Then he went on in this article in the Dallas Morning News and said America can confront the dark forces of division that still exist. 
What are these dark forces of division that causes this kind of split in the United States of America? What did Miss Sarah McClendon, the elderly Washington Post news reporter, say at the news conference March 7th, 1997, when Bill Clinton was talking about all these campaign funds that came from the Asians and how they were illegal? Then she stopped the whole news conference and said, well, what about all these people that are spreading hate-mongering in America? How that the United Nations is about to take over the country? And how there are United Nations troops and foreign troops in the country. What are you going to do about it? This is creating division in our country. Bill Clinton went on and said, we need the United Nations. We'll not get out of it. We need NATO. We need all of these things. There was a man by the name of William Colby. He was a former CIA director. He just happened to have a boating accident, according to CNN News, ABC, NBC, and CBS. But according to his close friends, he was assassinated because he had already revealed some truth as to what happened in Waco, Texas, Ruby Ridge, and then the Oklahoma City bombing. Here's what he said to a good friend, attorney John D. Camp of Nebraska. This man knew William Colby very well. And this Mr. Camp said that a few months before Mr. Colby died, and I'll say assassinated, he said that he knew there was deep unrest in the United States of America. And according to Bill Colby, he said that his projection based upon all the reports that came across his desk that three-quarters of the American people, that's 75%, now hate their government. Not the Constitution of the United States, but that our government is being changed from a constitutional republic to a communist dictatorship where the president can now sign executive orders and it becomes law. Where you and I, the people, have no say-so in anything. Mr. Colby said, unless... There becomes an open line of communication in America. There's going to become a great tragic event in America. He said a tragedy is just over the horizon. And unless our government began to listen to the people once again, there would be civil war and revolution in America. Do you believe this could happen in this country that has been so free in the past? that no one would ever think of rising up against their government? What if something were to happen because of the United Nations and legislation that would literally threaten the very lives and the existence of every single Christian in this country? Do you think there are not, there is anybody out there besides submissive Christians? Do you think there are not militia people who claim to be Christians, but they're hoarding guns? Do you think there are not people in this country that say, we will never give up our country? Oh, they're out there. They are out there. But you see, this conspiracy that is being worked in the world today fulfills Bible prophecy. And it's working in secret for world government. And just a few of the front organizations that are doing this is international communism. Anybody can see it that's been alive since 1919. But the other is the United Nations organization created by the Illuminati who created communism. And it's their world government through the United Nations organization. Now when you stop to look back every single pronouncement that has ever been made by Lenin, Marx, even back in the 1850s when he wrote his book outlining the plan for world government and so on, every pronouncement has been, we will take Central Europe, Eastern Europe, then we will take the masses of Asia, then we'll surround the United States of America, and it'll fall like a ripe grapefruit into our hands. So what have they done infiltrated in the United States? There was a man by the name of Mr. McCarthy from Wisconsin 
He started a probe of communists in our government back in the 1960s. He found there was 81 communists in the State Department. He was railroaded out of the Senate. And the word McCarthyism became a no-no word, saying there's a communist behind every bush and under every rock. But John J. McCloy, who was head of security for the State Department, later published a report saying Mr. McCarthy was wrong. There weren't 81 communists. There was 938 in one department of the United States government. But they have such power and control today that when they want to destroy someone, they use their controlled ABC, NBC, CBS, or CNN mass media. And they destroy the individual in the public's eyes just like they said they would in 1919 when they gained control of the mass media in America. So you don't hear these things on national television. You never will. Because they don't want you to know. They don't want you to know that they now have total control in Washington, D.C. They don't want you to know that they suspended the Constitution in 1913. 33 with the banking laws and the updating of the old war powers acts of 1917 they don't want you to know that franklin delano roosevelt declared bankruptcy and therefore we've been in a state of emergency and that's why a president can just make a law put it in the federal registry and it becomes law and it's a dictatorship in america And they said little by little they would pass legislation until the American people woke up one day and wouldn't know how a communist dictatorship had taken them over. I want to show you what they're doing today. It's called the Genocide Convention Treaty. You know, before I do that, though, I want to mention this. The great God of the universe and Jesus Christ does not lie. Whatever he says and whatever they put down in the pages of the Bible, it will happen. There will be no doubt about it for those who have the Spirit of God. All they have to do is wait and watch. Ezekiel 33, verse 1 to 9, it says very clearly in those scriptures that God would take someone of the coast of Israel or from the nation of Israel, and this book is for the last days. It would either be someone or a group or somebody. God would raise them up and they would blow the trumpet, a warning message that this nation is going into national captivity and it's going to be at the hands of the Illuminati, worshipers of Lucifer or Satan the devil. And he's going to create his world government and it's discussed in Revelation 13. Satan has devised the most clever plan that he could ever come up with so that he could divide religion, he could divide the very building blocks of Christianity and the family. It's called the Genocide Convention Treaty to the United Nations Organization. A Professor Limpkin is the individual who wrote the original draft, the United Nations Convention, on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. This was after World War II was over. You want to know why there were so many individual Jews that were killed? According to those who own the international banks, they're called the Illuminati, they said they had to sacrifice some of their lesser brethren for their purposes. What was their purpose? Their purpose was to create a state in Palestine for the future setting up of world government. Their purpose was to create anti-Semitism so that they could do whatever they wanted through the United Nations organization to create world government and no one would lift a finger or a voice against them. The Genocide Convention Treaty was adopted by the General Assembly in Paris on December 9th, 1948. Representatives of every single communist nation signed it immediately on that day. You know, they are the ones who committed genocide more than any other nation on the face of the earth, and yet every one of them signed it. Representatives of the United States 
signed it in Paris on December 11th, 1948. It was not adopted by the Congress of the United States, the Senate, however. It was turned down. President Harry Truman submitted it. But the Senate of the United States had such strong opposition against it in 1950 that it failed to pass. Then it went on before every single president until finally it was passed. In 1963, Secretary of State Rusk said the Kennedy administration would ratify the Genocide Convention Treaty if the Senate would adopt it. However, it was scuttled because lawyers who were still loyal to this country advised the Senate that it would be the most dangerous bill that could ever be passed into law in the United States. Then in 1965, under the Johnson administration, once again, it was scuttled. Then on February 19, 1970, President Nixon sent a message to Senate that he wanted it passed. However, they failed to pass it. They vetoed it on November 23, 1970. Under intense pressure from Senators Jacob Javits, who has been a one-worlder, William Proxmire, Senate Majority Leader at that time, Mike Mansfield, they promised to schedule floor action on the Genocide Convention Treaty in late 1972. However, it was scuttled once again because of such an uproar even as late as 1972. They said, we will bring it up again at a more proper time. In other words, when they have something they know will destroy this nation and destroy the Christian religion in this nation, they will never quit. Satan is persistent. His agents, whether they know they're his agents or not, will continue until they have completed their task. It's been universally known that the communists have always committed genocide. They committed genocide on a level in every nation they've taken over that would make the Nazis in World War II look like child's play or a kindergarten backyard. In the 1920s and the 1930s, while they were so... so Solidate, consolidating their power and their hold on all the Russian people. The communists said that they, for political reasons, murdered millions of human beings. Remember, this was political reasons. They killed entire races of people, classes of people, geographical groups such as in the Ukraine. They set up an embargo and would not let food come in either by air or by land. And seven million people starved to death in the Ukraine. And then there was the state of Georgia in Europe. They did the same thing. And it was for political reasons after World War II that the communists continued killing millions and millions of people. So when the Genocide Convention Treaty came up, and it was debated, they insisted on having the word political reasons taken out of the Genocide Convention Treaty. In other words, you can kill somebody if they're persecuting somebody for religious reasons. But if the government kills masses of people for political reasons, they're not subject to the Genocide Convention Treaty. As a direct result, the lawyers who had looked over the Genocide Convention Treaty came to the conclusion that it, if it was ratified, would be directed against individuals within nations and not the government of nations. And they came to the conclusion that it does not include political groups. They would not be safe. From governments. In short, the Genocide Convention Treaty would not outlaw genocide because the Soviet and all communist governments would be exempt from it. The only people that could ever be prosecuted would be private citizens of countries. 
Richard M. Nixon said in 1951 that he was against the Genocide Convention Treaty. But then when he came into the presidency, the first thing he did was bring it up for a vote. And it was once again rejected. So you see, there are individuals in this country who pretend to be one thing, but they're altogether something different when they get into power. Why do the liberals in our Senate, even in Congress, and so on, why do they always try to pass legislation that would harm the American people, that would destroy our freedoms, that would destroy the very foundation upon which we have based our whole way of life? I want to give some of the text of the Genocide Convention Treaty and let you see what they built into it so that when it was passed in 1985, when they start enforcing it under the Bill Clinton administration, you're going to see people from every walk of life running for their life in the United States of America. There's going to be law enforcement agencies after them, tracking them down. And if you know anything about them, you will be declared as guilty as they are in the law and the eyes of the law. Notice now in section Article 2, Section B of the Genocide Convention Treaty. It says you would be guilty of genocide if you cause serious mental harm to people. Mental harm. This means you have never hurt them. You've never pulled a gun on them. You've never used a bow and arrow on them. You've never tried to murder them by cutting the gas line or maybe the brake lines or whatever. You've never set a bomb in their car to blow them up. But it's just by mental harm, the words you use, no matter who you are, whatever you say out of your mouth, someone could sue you if they knew it, if they said it caused them mental harm. Notice in Article 3, Section C, it says direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Now, what if there was an law, a law enforcement officials called the FBI or the BATF? What if there were patriotic programs on the radio? What if they were telling about the government and its procedures and how it was turning toward communism and socialism and how the Constitution had been ripped out of the people's hands? And when they go into the court systems, there are no fair trials. Anytime you go into a court system and a judge, which happened in the Oklahoma City bombing, said that 70 of the top witnesses could not testify because they could prove there was a conspiracy by government to blow up that building. And they wouldn't let them testify because the judge said, no, we don't want any conspiracy theories brought into the trial. So the defense collapsed. They had no way of proving that Timothy McFay was just a small piece of the big puzzle. But if somebody were to come on radio or television, the government could accuse them of creating public incitement against the government. Therefore, they would say, you're committing genocide. Then there is another part, section E of Article 3, that talks about complicity. Have you ever heard the word complicity and look it up to find out what it really means in an unabridged dictionary? It simply means that you agree with what is said or what is done. You don't even have to be a part of it. All you have to do is say, I agree, and you're an accomplice to someone that is convicted of genocide. What are all the implications of all this for the American people? What about Christianity? What about Bill Clinton in the future if he remains president to the full ex extent of his term? There is a false doctrine today in the political arena, but 
it's accepted by the people and the courts of America. That is that a treaty can override the Constitution of the United States and it becomes automatic law of the land. Many people believe that. But it is not true. You can read the documents of all the founding fathers of this country in discussing treaty and why they put Article 6, Section 2 into the Constitution of the United States. And every one of them said, no, if a treaty could override the Constitution, we would have no Constitution. What are we doing here? No, all treaties had to conform to our Constitution. It couldn't change the Constitution. But those who are working for world government, the Illuminati, they infiltrate in secret and have taken over government positions, judgeships, Supreme Court justices, and right on down the line, heading up law schools and our colleges and universities. And they're the ones who are twisting and changing the meaning of law. And when you read the protocols, which is a 24-step plan for world government, they said they would infiltrate the political arena. They would create laws that would say one thing and then pass laws that said the exact opposite so that they would be opposite and whatever they wanted to determine whether a person's guilty or not, they would use the laws that fit the circumstance. When they actually were exact opposites, but they're both on the law books. So what do we see in America today? A breakdown in the judicial system. Here's what the head of the Notre Dame Law School, Mr. Clarence E. Mannion, had to say about the Genocide Convention Treaty as to whether it should ever be passed into law or not. I quote, The dangers inherent in the rat and ratification of the Genocide Treaty are immensely greater now than they were when the American Bar Association rejected it 20 years ago. He wrote this, or he said it on national radio, in 1970. In 1949, the word genocide was never heard except in context of Hitler's Germany. Today, the term is being thrown around recklessly like a flaming torch in all directions. We hear, it, we hear it in the course of criminal prosecutions, campus demonstrations, and anti-war pro protests. Nothing that is said or done against any person can be immunized against the charge of genocide. If this emotionally charged treaty becomes the law of the land, end of quote. So he simply said anything that is brought up against somebody as an individual, then they say genocide. Then this is going to start ripping our nation apart. Because how can you defend yourself against genocide? You can't do it to consolidate all of the dictatorships in, the, in Russia and all the other satellite countries, they exterminated millions. And yet, under this law, they could not be punished. Because it would be a political genocide, not mental harm. So all the millions under political genocide, they would just die in vain. Ever since this treaty has been passed, we've seen international communism, in every nation. And these are nations that signed the Genocide Treaty. The United States was one of the last ones that signed it. All the rest signed it years ago. And yet in every one of those countries, when they're overthrown by communists, they wipe out the most educated, the political rulers, and anyone in the military that stands against them and can create a rebellion against the communist government. Yet those are political prisoners, so they could be exterminated. Notice what Senator Helms said, Jesse Helms said, and this was back in 1984, right before it was brought up for Ronald, by Ronald Reagan for the Senate to pass it. He said, I do not believe that there is a single expert who has studied the United Nations Convention on Genocide who really thinks it will prevent or even punish genocide anywhere in the world. 
End of quote. A former Senator Steve Sims had this to say, quote, While we have not signed the treaty that was one and a half months before it was finally signed and ratified, we have not been guilty of genocide, and the perpetrators of genocide, nearly without exception, are all signatories to the convention. End of quote. So why would the United States sign it if we were not committing genocide? Do you realize that back in the 1950s and in the 1960s, before we ever signed it, there were groups, racial groups in America, that sued the government of the United States and wanted our Congress and the President executed because they claimed genocide. And the only reason they weren't tried in a court, every one of our congressmen and the president, was because we had never signed the Genocide Convention Treaty as yet. That's all that kept them out of the courts in The Hague. To be exact, in the context of the Genocide Convention Treaty, it says that you and I would be tried in a court in our own area unless one of the parties objected and wanted to go to The Hague in Holland. If it went to The Hague, can you imagine someone who really is a Christian or someone who is really going to stand against the New World Order? Them ever coming back from The Hague? I can't imagine it. They will convict them every single time. There will be no way that they will ever get out of it. You see... I have proven so many times that the United Nations organization, its court, world court, is controlled by international communists. Why would they ever let someone go unconvicted that was trying to stop international communism? They wouldn't. So anybody from the United States of America that stood up against it and was, and was accused of genocide, would automatically be convicted. When President Reagan finally decided to go ahead and ask for this Genocide Convention Treaty to be ratified, right before it was ratified, here's what the Chattanooga Free Press said. This was 1984, about a month before it was brought up for ratification. I quote, Reagan means well. But the American people should be alerted to the acute need to stand up and insist upon continued United States rejection of the Genocide Convention Treaty. The trouble is that it, the treaty, sounds good, but would potentially have very terrible results. End of quote. What are some of these very terrible results that could happen to you and me and every other person in the United States of America. Under the term hate crime, this is now the laws that have been passed. I want to discuss those very terrible results now because remember, I read you the analysis of the lawyers who had read the convention and said that it was directed against individuals and not against nations. Now, if this is directed against individuals, and that I have proven in the times past that the United Nations is totally, absolutely controlled by communists, and communists are anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-family, and most of all, anti-American. Because the United States of America on February 29th, 1892, leap year, was declared with a 9 nothing decision of the Supreme Court that this was a Christian nation. Not that the people lived it, but that all the precepts and how it was founded was founded upon Christianity. So international communism, which was founded by the Illuminati, which is inspired by Satan the devil, he is the one giving rise. So do you think that he is going to allow the American people to continue to be Christians? No, he's not. Communism must destroy 
First of all, government officials that oppose them. Secondly, college-educated individuals. Thirdly, they said they would destroy every minister in the nation. I don't mean just put them in a farm somewhere to work. No, no, exterminate. They said, this was the head of the Communist Party, USA, Mr. Foster. He said those Christians love to sing about the blood. We'll slit their throats and drag them across the mourner's bench. We'll show them blood. This has not changed as of 1963 when he repeated it at the funeral of one of his communist comrades that died. So yes, international communism is still there, headed by the Illuminati. They will not allow the American way of life to go on. It must be radically altered. They say that religion is the opiate of the people. Now, if religion is the opiate of the people, what do those in international communism say? Here's what Stalin said. Quote, Communism is our opium to replace Christianity for the people. He said that their foreign policy means ruse and intrigue. Our internal policy is found upon terror. In other words, in the Soviet Union and every communist country, once they have absolute and undeniable control, they create laws where family members betray other family members so they can be in good status with the government. And the government won't knock on their door in the middle of the night and take them away. And they're never seen again. Stalin said, not only is our internal inside the United States or any other country policy terror, but he said our aim is world domination. And then he made several statements about those Yankees on the North American continent that they would eventually control them. And he said this in his final paragraph, Comrades, don't forget one thing. Talk about peace, but always prepare to fight. At home in Russia, you can walk with heavy shoes. However, slink in the Western world on soft soles until also the Western world belongs to us. End of quote. Do they mean business? You bet they do. They've got past the Genocide Convention Treaty. Let's explore it now. We've seen the absolute proof in times past and nearly a thousand cassette tapes that we have that the United Nations was created by communists, the Illuminati. It's run today by pro-communist socialists. Every single Secretary General of the United Nations has been pro-socialist, pro-communist. That's why when they always appoint people to positions, they're always pro-socialist and pro-communist. And their purpose is to create a one-world government that is talked about in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. A scarlet-colored beast. Scarlet is a derivative of red. What is the only movement in the 20th century that has declared itself that its aim and purpose is world domination, international red communism. And it's controlled by the Illuminati or Satan the devil. And they said the aim written right in the context of the Genocide Convention Treaty was that they were going to persecute. That's not their word, that's mine. They say prosecute individuals. But who are these individuals? They're you. They're me. They're people just like us. They're individuals who will not give up their freedom to international communism. They're sitting there waiting. They're not speaking. You've heard them talk on radio and television at election time about the silent majority that don't go to the polls, but they're out there. In Article 2 of the treaty, Clause B, it says an individual could be cited for causing mental harm. 
and you would be convicted of genocide. It could be racial. It could be a slur against someone of another race. It could be religious. It could be speaking out and saying the Pope is a false prophet or a false minister, the head of the mystery Babylonian religion. It could be any one of those things. And you could be charged with mental harm. What's going to happen when a minister and when God has called that person and that person cannot but speak the words that he knows he has to to warn a nation and he stands in a pulpit and he speaks and he goes out on radio and television and then he says, no, there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's not multiple of choice. There is no way you can be saved except through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one and only Savior of this world. Buddhism won't get it. Hinduism won't do it. Their people, their bones, their founders of that religion, their bones are still in the grave. But Jesus Christ, when they've looked for His bones, were gone. He came out of that grave alive. And He's alive right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, pleading our cause. What do you think they're going to do? Lawsuits are going to begin to be filed in circuit courts all over the nation by every Jewish rabbi, maybe, who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, but they're waiting for their Messiah. And they say, look, we've got a red heifer now, and so we're going to cleanse the sanctuary when we build our temple. We're going to cleanse the Levitical priesthood and start offering sacrifices again. This is telling us our Messiah is near. And you're saying it's Jesus. And so the mental harm suits begin to fly. And then the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a communist front organization and declared so in 1944 by the Senate Subcommittee on Un-American Activities. They published a whole book of every communist front organization in America at that time. They even gave a history of Roger Baldwin the founder of it, that he was a card-carrying communist. And he said that his goal was to make America just like Russia. So they're going to be sending out lawsuits. They're going to be see seeing to it that every Christian program on radio and television is shut down. Oh yes, they've got a clever way. Because they say that the Genocide Convention Treaty now is equal to and supersedes the Constitution of the United States. If that's the case, that means your and my First Amendment right that guarantees us freedom of speech is done. It's finished. It's over with. It's going to open Pandora's box. And there's going to be people who do not want to confront government or the FBI, or the BATF, or the DEA, or anybody else in government because they'll be afraid their house will be broken into. They'll be going to prison. Yes, the United States of America, Great Britain, the British Commonwealth, which has taken Christianity around the world, Australia, South Africa, which is already in communist hands, and they're persecuting, and you never hear about it on the media, but they're killing them by the thousands all over Africa and Asia as they overthrow. Mental harm is going to be the excuse that is used to stop the command of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to go you therefore into all the world and teach all nations or all peoples that will listen. Oh, yes. They're not going to let the name of Jesus because remember who is the target of Satan? He hates Jesus Christ because he could not cause Jesus Christ to sin even at the last moment on that stake because he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. He couldn't even get Jesus to sin then. So Jesus is going to forgive this world. He's going to send Satan into the lake of fire and he's going to be destroyed and so Satan must destroy as many of you and me as he can before his time is up. Oh yes, the time is coming. Because you see, ministers are private individuals. And the Genocide Convention Treaty, they said it in their own terminology, that it was to prosecute private 
individuals and not nations. Article 4 says this, Persons committing genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall be punished, whether they are constitutionally responsible rulers, public officials, or private individuals. Have they got it set up? Yes, they have. Satan's clever. He's been around a long time. He's going to know how to send the lawsuits to the right people at the right time to shut them up. But you see, a little man came to our building on four separate occasions. Every single time he said, speak the truth. Keep speaking with Holy Spirit boldness. God is protecting this building and this ministry. We must speak the truth. Because somebody is going to have to someday stand before the United Nations with the cameras going. Maybe they'll have world trials. And somebody's going to have to stand there and declare that no, this is the beast power. Jesus the Christ is the one and only Savior of this world. And Jesus Christ promised in Luke 21 that don't you even think what you're going to say when you're confronted by these government rulers. He said, I'll give you what to say in that moment. Oh yes, you'll never be ashamed of what you say if Jesus Christ opens your mouth and wags your tongue and the eloquent words comes out, even though you may not be an eloquent speaker today, if God uses you as a testimony against the nations of this world, you'll speak fluently and they will not be able to resist what you have to say. They'll know you're telling the truth, but they will hate you with a purple passion. Oh yes, God's getting ready to close out the end of the age and this message is going to go out as a witness to every person on the planet earth. It will be done. Because you see, Jesus Christ prophesied in the last part of the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 45 to 47. He literally said that He opened their understanding to the Scriptures. And then He said to them, Thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name or by His authority among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. And they did it on the day of Pentecost, 31 A.D. Oh yes, Jesus has fulfilled His words. This, Mr. L this little Mr. Trueblood that came in also made another fascinating statement. He said, there were 153 fishes, one place in the Bible. He said, God has shown me to tell you that there are originally designed to be 153 nations on earth. Not, not the way men have divided them up. And all 153 of those nations have been reached with the message of Jesus Christ. Now it's your job in this ministry to tell the United States of America what is going to happen to them. And he says, but always be truthful and never lie. God will be with you and God will protect you. They will abuse you and your members verbally, but not physically. Have we heard that before from the pages of the Bible? Have we heard that God is going to take a group of people and He's going to protect them? And they're going to have an ingathering of saints? And they're looking forward to the day when they will be so perfected in God's eyes because they dare to repent of their sins and change their life and to be different that God will protect them? Oh yes, this Genocide Convention Treaty, when Bill Clinton enforces it and his enforcer, Janet Reno, and they send the FBI, the VATF, and all the rest of them, you're going to hope and you're going to pray and you're going to be acutely aware of the necessity of being on Jesus Christ's side and not on the other team at all. Satan's number one tactic has always been to divide and conquer. He does it in the church. He does it in nations. He believes in dividing them along political lines, racial lines, so he creates tension in the races of the world. He divides religiously. He keeps dividing and dividing and dividing. 
He does it even between male and female. He does it between city slickers and country bumpkins, they used to call them. Oh, I remember those days. Oh, yes, they create divisions against all these people so that they will create larger and larger divisions. Therefore, Satan weakens all obstacles standing in his way for world takeover. Then by the use of the Genocide Convention Treaty, Satan is now ready to divide the very building blocks of civilization, the family. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, yes, even church members that have forgotten to seek you the first, the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and who have forgotten why they came here. They will turn them against other church members. How? How is it going to happen? And how is this genocide convention treaty going to be used? Very cleverly placed within the acts of genocide that are to be punishable by international courts is Article 3, Section E, which says complicity. What is complicity? Webster's New International Dictionary, the second edition, unabridged, says complicity, an accomplice, a participation in guilt. In other words, what would a person be guilty of? Well, preaching Jesus Christ and causing mental harm to those of other religions. I'll just use myself as an example. I can't use somebody else. But what if I or some other minister were to be preaching Jesus Christ and causing mental harm? Then they would apply Article 2, Section B. They would be found guilty of causing mental harm to people of other religions. And then of all things, if you attend this church, no, don't go running out now, but if you attend this church and if you agree Bible prophecy is happening and if you agree that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of the living God, then you become an accomplice because I've been found guilty, then you're an accomplice with my guilt. Guilt by association. Oh yes, Satan is clever. He will start his persecution. I can remember the sermon that I gave about the end gathering the Strong's Concordance number 1996, 1997, come together, all come together. The number 1997, that's what it meant. 1998 means come running together. In other words, what would cause a difference? Could it be the Genocide Convention Treaty is now going to be discussed how to implement it how to punish people, how to convict them, and it said even how to head off the crime of genocide. How are they going to head off genocide? Well, if I cause someone mental harm by the preaching I do, and they can't refute it because it's all documented, and it causes them mental harm, then they can shut me off radio so that I can't make contact with anybody else. They could come in and confiscate our building. They could confiscate everything we had to prevent us causing mental harm to somebody else. Can't you see from this very genocide treaty how they're going to shut down Christianity? It's so clear. But we couldn't understand what this was until after it was revealed that it was against individuals instead of nations like Russia. Once you saw the full text of the Genocide Convention Treaty, then all of a sudden the light bulbs came on. This is Satan's tool when he's ready to conquer America. But you know, you and I shouldn't even worry about it. Not at all. Just because Jesus made statements like Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10, 
Then shall they, that's these government officials, the Antichrist, communist, socialist, deliver you, and he's talking to his disciples who are followers of Jesus, therefore we call them Christians. They will deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. That was right before the rapture, see. And you shall be hated of all nations for my Jesus Christ's name's sake. And we couldn't understand how in the world that people, Christians, could be hated of all other people on earth for just because we were believers in Jesus until the Genocide Convention Treaty and Satan is the one behind it. Many shall be offended. Yes, many, even in the Christian community, will not want to see their head lopped off. They'll not want to see scar tissue around their throat. No, they'll not want to be imprisoned. They'll ask for immunity if I turn in the church member list. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. How could you ever hate a Christian? Only those that forgot their purpose. They forgot why they were called. They forgot that Jesus Christ is creating brothers and sisters and that we have to put Him first in our life, and that we're to seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness, and a part of righteousness is absolute, undeniable loyalty. Loyalty to God first and to every person that has received the Spirit of the living God into their mind. Loyal to one another. But those who become weak, indifferent, nonchalant, non-caring. They think that it's a long time coming, yet they've got 20 or 30 years. Oh yes, they'll be so shocked and surprised, they'll turn us in. You bet they will. All this is a direct result of mental harm and their fear of being accused in an international court of complicity, being in agreement. Therefore, you are automatically guilty. You know, Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 9, then verse 12 and 13, He warned us. He said, Take heed to yourselves, for they, once again, this is the Antichrist system, shall deliver you up to councils. Yes, that's governments. That's their court system. And in the synagogues, that's religions. You know, they're creating a world religion right now through the United Nations Organization. Anybody that will not fit themselves into that religious organization of world religion will be on the outside. We will be hauled into their chambers. And it said, you shall be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my Jesus' sake for a testimony against them. That will be your job, those of us who remain faithful. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And you, Christians, shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You know, the persecution may come before the final three and a half years when God says He will take a group of His people and place them in a place of safety. In Luke 21, verse 16 to 18, notice Jesus' words once again. Remember, these are warnings for us not to let down, not to be indifferent, not to think casually about salvation and about being strong. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren. That's other Christians. Because the next word said, and kinfolks and friends. That's physical, outside people that are not church members. And some shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But here's the beautiful part. There shall not a hair of your head perish. He's talking about spiritually. If you or I were to have the honor to be a martyr for Jesus Christ, the next instant we would know we would be in the resurrection from the dead. Time would pass until all of a sudden the seventh trump. 
you wouldn't have to worry about it. Now, for my final concluding statements. What are going to be the ultimate results of the Genocide Convention Treaty? The lawsuits that are inevitable. The ultimate results on the religious community was prophesied in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea, call it the Atlantic Sea, to sea, call it the Pacific, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Why? Because people like Bill Clinton, Janet Reno, the other international Illuminati members that control absolutely the government of the United States and the United Nations are going to create a blackout of all communications, whether it's through the mail, whether it's by radio, television, pamphlets printed at printing offices, so that they will stop the Word of God from going to the people. Oh yes, it's very likely it's going to occur soon. You know what would happen and what could happen? If every single person in this nation would repent, every person. In Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 it says this, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my, this is Jesus Christ's face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, let's face it. What are the odds of 270 million people, every single one of them, turning to the living Jesus Christ and receiving forgiveness of their sins? What are the odds? Slim and none. None. Luke 21. Therefore, the only people that are going to be concerned is you and me. What are you and I going to be doing? Or better be doing? Luke 21, verse 36. After Jesus just gave the entire chapter talking about what's going to happen at the close of the age, He says, Watch you, therefore... That's what we try to do in this church. Follow Jesus' simplest command. Watch what's going on in the world so that we will know what's about to happen. And pray always. In other words, have a constant attitude of prayer and thanksgiving to God that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And I guarantee you the Genocide Convention Treaty is coming. And when it comes, America is going to be a different place. It will turn into another Soviet Union. Every communist country in the world where family members will be turning others in. Church members will be turning in whole rosters that go to that church to save their neck and to receive immunity from prosecution. Oh, it's going to come. Jesus said, you and I had better pray that we're accounted worthy to escape it. Escape what? It said death being turned in by family members, church members, imprisoned. And then it also says we'd better pray that we will stand before the Son of Man. I say praise God that we have the opportunity to know what is going to happen before it happens. And all the way back in 1985, I began to warn about the Genocide Convention Treaty. When they implement it, get ready America. Now Bill Clinton has already called for it to be implemented and how they're going to administer it. Just wait. This country will never be the same again.